All right, greetings everyone. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for making worship a priority this weekend. I want to also welcome all you folks who are joining us online, wherever you might be. We're always glad to welcome you. And I want to give a special shout out to all of you who are worshiping down at our Impact Old Southside campus as we launch our first microsite, what we hope will be the first of many. Um, a microsite church is another ministry of Mount Pleasant Christian Church. It's our effort to make sure that everyone knows that you can have church anywhere in this day and age. You can have church anywhere. So we welcome all of you. Grab your Bible if you brought one and go with me to the Gospel of John, the third chapter. And when you get there, just hold that ready for a few minutes. Before we turn our attention to the scriptures, I want to talk to you about a couple of things real quickly. And this first one is not really going to impact those of you who come to church on Saturday night, but I want to let you know anyway. Beginning on the first weekend of November, November 6th and 7th, we're going to be changing our service times, our Sunday morning service times from 9.15 and 11 o'clock simply to 9 o'clock and 10.45. I know it's not a huge change, but uh, everybody needs to know about that. Uh, basically, we're, we are getting to the place where our, our first service on Sunday is getting pretty full and uh, our second service on Sunday has a lot of room and we want to try to encourage some people maybe to go to the second service. The second thing I want to mention to you uh, before we begin our message is this. Uh, recently, Johnette Cruz, who many of you know, uh, has uh, been a part of our church staff for a long, long time, made the decision to leave her position here at Mount Pleasant and pursue a new uh, career opportunity. Uh, she served uh, here for eight and a half years. She was the face of our church in many ways, the face of all of our announcements, uh, our MPTV announcements, and all kinds of things like that. And I just wanted to uh, publicly thank her for her time and her service. I'm someone who really values loyalty, and uh, I'm deeply appreciative of Johnette's service and her loyalty over the last eight and a half years. So if you ever have a chance to see her, uh, just tell her thank you for all of her service. All right, as you just heard from Mike Sheely, we're going to begin a new three-week sermon series this weekend called Stories You Thought You Knew. In the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at the familiar stories of David and Goliath, uh, Daniel and the lion's den. But we're going to kick it off this weekend by talking about the story of Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Now, granted... This may not be as familiar a story as the others I just mentioned, but I love this story, and it's in this story where we find what are arguably the most familiar words in all the Bible. I'm talking about John 3.16. I'll put that verse up on the screen. Let's read it together. Let me hear your voices. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's John 3.16 from my New International Version Bible this weekend. I love that verse, and I love this story of Jesus and Nicodemus. You may or may not be familiar with the name Francis Schaeffer. He was an American theologian. He was a philosopher. He was an author, and he was a Presbyterian minister. One of the things Schaeffer is most well-known for is the founding of a retreat center in Switzerland called Labri. Labri is the French word for shelter. Labri was a place where seekers would come and spend time, and while they were there, they could explore their questions related to matters of truth, related to matters of faith, related to matters of religion. It was a place where they could, for example, examine the claims of Christ in light of the different arguments and the different objections that always surround the claims of Christ. And the basic attitude that Francis Schaeffer established at Labrie was that honest questions are good because the Christian faith is strong enough to stand in the face of any challenge. Just a couple of years ago, about this same time of year, we did a series called Room for Doubt. I don't know if you remember that or not. We even kicked off the series with a very special guest speaker, a man named Mark Middleberg, who is one of the leading Christian apologists in the U.S. A Christian apologist is someone who defends the truth of Christianity. And one of the things we wanted to accomplish with that series is to establish the truth that it's okay to have questions when it comes to the Christian faith. It's even okay to have doubts when it comes to the Christian faith. It's okay to bring your questions and your doubts to church. That's what we wanted to try to do 
communicate with that series. One of the things we wanted to communicate with that series, one of Mark Middleberg's best friends is Lee Strobel, who is also a leading Christian apologist in the U.S. And just a year before Room from Doubt, many of you will remember that we welcomed Lee into one of our weekend services when we rolled out our One Life series. If you know Lee's story, you know that he was an avowed atheist his entire life. But when his wife became a Christian, he set out on a journey to prove that Christianity was false. But after two years of investigating the claims of Christianity, he was overwhelmed by the truth and he himself became a Christian. And I can stand up here and tell you with integrity that after Lee Strobel and the One Life series and Mark Middleberg and the Room for Doubt series, I became absolutely convinced in my life that the church needs to be a place, not just that it can be a place, but the church needs to be a place where people come with their questions and they come even with their doubts. Because as I said a little bit earlier, the Christian faith is strong enough to stand in the face of any challenge. And that's something we need to remember because the world has always been and will always be filled with seekers, with seekers. I'm talking about people who are seeking to understand the great questions of life because they feel an emptiness on the inside that can't be filled up by anything that the world has to offer. We need to open our arms and our hearts and our church to people just like that. Maybe that describes some of you who are here in this service. Maybe it describes some of you who are joining us online today. I want you to know, if it does, that you're welcome here. You are. And you're welcome here for uh, a couple of reasons. First, because we want to love you and we want to accept you. And second, because we want to do the best we can to answer the questions that you have. And I feel that way because, well, I feel that way for many different reasons. But one of the reasons, one of the, the reasons is because of the example that Jesus sets for us in our story in John chapter 3 when it came to a man named Nicodemus. So if you've got your Bibles open there to John chapter 3 and you're able, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of the Scripture. I got my NIV Bible with me once again after a couple of weeks uh, in the New Living Translation. And I'm going to read John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 18, you follow along as I read. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit, notice that the spirit there is capitalized, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases you hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going so it is with everyone born of the spirit how can this be nicodemus asked you are israel's teacher said jesus and do you not understand these things i tell you the truth we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen but still you people do not accept our testimony i have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe how then will you believe if i speak of heavenly things no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the son of man and just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always pray that God would bless the reading and the hearing of his word. What we have in the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3 is the story of a seeker, a seeker. But Nicodemus wasn't just any seeker. He was a high-ranking Jew who was a Pharisee and a member of what my NIV Bible calls the Jewish ruling council. Now, I don't have time 
in this service to give you a lot of explanation. So let me just say this. Nicodemus was a really big deal when it came to the Jewish religious hierarchy because he was a member of something that was known as the Sanhedrin, which was basically the Supreme Court of ancient Israel. But here in our story, we see him coming to see Jesus by night. Now, I'm going to pause here and say that there's always been different speculation about why Nicodemus came at night. Most people believe that Nicodemus came to see Jesus at night uh, because as a member of the Sanhedrin, he didn't want anyone to know. And so he was trying to come to him in secret. He was kind of hiding this visit to Jesus. I think that's a reasonable speculation. And honestly, that's what I believed for a long time. But let me suggest something different as we think about Nicodemus' story together today. Maybe Nicodemus went to see Jesus at night because he knew that all of the Jewish leaders who approached Jesus by day were pretty much hostile toward Jesus, almost all of them. And Nicodemus didn't feel that way. Nicodemus didn't feel hostility toward Jesus because he was a seeker. He was seeking something from Jesus. And so I think he came by night because he wanted to come at a time and he wanted to come in a way that would make a conversation with Jesus possible because, and here's my belief, and I'll just say this is just mine, my belief is Nicodemus was a man who felt like he really needed to talk to Jesus. You ever been there? You ever been at a point in your life where you felt like there was somebody that you really needed to talk to? I mean, more than anything else, you needed to find a way to get in front of that person so that you could have a conversation. I've been there. I've been there many times. Just a couple of weeks ago, Sandy and I, we were, we were off the weekend, and, I, and we drove to Nashville, Tennessee, just so I could see a friend of mine that I needed to talk to. I felt like I needed to talk to. I needed to hear his advice and his counsel about something that I was dealing with in my life. And so I was willing to take vacation time and be away from church just so I could get in his presence and have a conversation. And I think, friends, again, this is just my speculation, but I think that's the way Nicodemus felt about Jesus. And that's why he went to him under the cover of night. He didn't want to go to him in the appearance of being hostile. He wanted to have the freedom to have a conversation, and it was best for him to do it at night. And here's the really interesting thing that's always stood out to me about this story of Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus because he needed to talk to him, and before Nicodemus even asked Jesus his question, the question that drove him there Jesus gave him the answer. Before he even spoke the words of the question, Jesus gave him his answer. Look back at John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 again. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, now notice, stop right here, notice. He didn't ask a question, did he? He just shared his introductory remarks. He probably had them fairly rehearsed, don't you think? He said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. And then in reply, this is verse 3, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, you ought to write down in the margin of your Bible in John chapter 3 this one thing. Jesus answered Nicodemus' question before he even asked. Do you know that the strongest characteristic of John's gospel, the thing that sets John's gospel significantly apart from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is that in John's gospel, there's this clear theme of Jesus as God. That's what sets it apart. That's the theme of John's gospel. He doesn't present Jesus to us as a, an ordinary man. It doesn't present Jesus to us as an extraordinary man. It presents Jesus to us as God. Hold your place in John chapter 3, and you'll be able to do this quickly. Just turn one page to the left, probably, to John chapter 1. One page to the left to John chapter 1. 
John's gospel is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's also in that it begins with a prologue, a prologue, and that's found in the first uh, 18 verses. If you go to John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, this is what you read. This is how John's gospel begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You ought to put your finger on the word, Word, in those two verses. You notice that it's capitalized in your Bibles? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the, in the original language of the New Testament, that word... For word is the Greek word logos, L-O-G-O-S. You can see it on the screen. And you know what? It wasn't a dramatic word in the Greek language. It was a pretty ordinary word, in fact. It was a word that basically meant word, just like it's translated here, or speech. Here's how I think about it whenever I read it. I think of the word communication. The word logos basically means communication. And this is the word John, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chooses to use... When he wants to describe Jesus, again, you notice that the word, word, is capitalized. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's what he says. He's describing Jesus. And so John is saying that Jesus, who was with God from the beginning of time, came into the world as the communication of God. That's the essence of what he's saying there. He continues to talk about Jesus as the Word as we go down the chapter. Scroll down from where we were in verses 1 and 2 to verse 14, John chapter 1 and verse 14. As he continues to talk about Jesus, as he continues to talk about the Word, which is Jesus, he says, the Word became flesh and blood and made his dwelling among us. Now, I want to stop right there for a moment. Uh, This was Love Your Neighbor Weekend. I think you heard about that in MPTV, and I visited all the different sites where people were working, and it was a great, great (coughs) experience today. Our impact sites, if you've never been there, they're, they're just, it's a unique multi-site model of our ministry. We have other church families around the city of Indianapolis. They don't use the Mount Pleasant name because they're in Indianapolis. They're not in Greenwood. And we call them impact sites. We have Impact Christian Church Old Southside, Impact Christian Church Fairfax, and Impact Christian Church Bethany. And when we think about our impact ministries, or when I was thinking about our impact ministries, I chose this verse, the first part of John chapter 1 and verse 14, as the verse for our impact ministries, but I chose it the way it reads in the message, which is a paraphrase of the New Testament. Here in my NIV Bible, it says, the word became flesh and blood and made his dwelling among us. That's the reality of Jesus coming into the world. But in the message paraphrase, it says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And that's what we've done with our impact campuses. We've identified different neighborhoods and we've moved into those neighborhoods to make an impact, a spiritual impact in those neighborhoods. And so I'm so appreciative of everyone who put that together and who volunteered today. I know you got the greatest blessing. But John continues to talk about Jesus here in verse 14. The word became flesh and blood and made his dwelling among us. And then he says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father full of grace and truth. And so what John's gospel is telling us right from the beginning, and this is the theme of John's gospel all throughout the book, is that Jesus was no ordinary man. When he was in the world, he was literally God in human flesh. Now, as we think about that truth, we go back to John chapter 3 in our story. And as God in human flesh, Jesus knew the question that drove Nicodemus to come and see him that night under the cover of darkness. And so, before Nicodemus is ever able to even articulate the question, Jesus basically looks at him and he says this. If I were to put it in my own words, he looks at him and he says, I know something's missing from your life. Here's what you need to know. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And that's how the conversation began. And in this setting, when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he was basically saying, no one can be right with God. He was basically saying, no one can be saved because being right with God is the fundamental meaning of salvation. Salvation allows us to be right with God. And so he looked at Nicodemus before Nicodemus even asked his question and said, no one can be right with God. No one can be saved unless he is born again. Because, friends, that's what was missing in Nicodemus' life. No question about it. Because all the things that Nicodemus was doing as a religious man, 
all the things Nicodemus was doing as a religious Jew. I'm talking about things like keeping the Old Testament law. I'm talking about things like performing endless religious rituals over and over and over again. None of that was enough to help him escape the nagging feeling that something was missing in his life. And Jesus, as God, knew that right from the beginning. And so what happens next after Jesus just cuts to the chase, I don't have any time for small talk, let's get right to it. After that, what happens next is Jesus and Nicodemus have a conversation. And in that conversation, Jesus tells Nicodemus three things that every single person needs to know and understand in order to be right with God, in order to be saved, in order to fill up and satisfy the yearning of your heart that God put there when he created you. I'm going to explain each one of them with a single word. If you're someone who likes to take notes, here's the first word. It's the word spiritual. Write that down somewhere. It's the word spiritual. And here's what I mean by that. Through the course of this conversation, everybody look up here for a moment. I'm not going to go verse by verse through these 18 verses. That's not my point today, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, get uh, sidetracked by some of the different arguments that can come from these verses about certain meanings. I'm just going to cut right to the chase, and I'm going to talk to you about what everyone needs to know in order to be saved, what everyone needs to know in order to be right with God. That's the basic fundamental meaning of this story. And the first thing Jesus tells uh, Nicodemus that he needs to know can be captured by this word spiritual, because here's the thing that Jesus is saying, no matter who you are, no matter who you are, Being right with God, again, that's the fundamental meaning of salvation. Being right with God, first and foremost, is a spiritual event. It's a spiritual event. I'm going to go back to John chapter 3 and begin in verse 3 and read down through verse 6 again. Follow along. In reply, this is after Nicodemus says his introductory remarks to Jesus. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God. No one can be right with God. No one can be saved unless he is born again. And then Nicodemus responds, how can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. And then pay close attention to what Jesus says next. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, gives birth to spirit. Now I'm going to make this explanation as simple as possible, in those days, and this, is, this would have been right where Nicodemus lived, this would have been right where Nicodemus was coming from, in those days, a Jewish man believed that he could achieve and maintain a right relationship with God through physical acts, by doing physical things, starting with being physically born into a Jewish family because they were God's chosen people. But in addition to that, it would be physical acts like being circumcised if you were a man. It would be physical acts like wearing a certain kind of clothing that was prescribed by the law, washing your hands in a certain way that was prescribed by the law, and on and on and on. It's what I was talking about earlier when I mentioned endless religious rituals that were done over and over and over again. And for most Jews, the truth is that was the extent of their religious life. No wonder Nicodemus felt like something was missing. Let me ask you a question. If you believed as a modern-day Christian or a modern-day seeker, that all there was to being right with God, all there was to being saved was for you to come to church once a week and then get up and leave? Do you think that would be satisfying to your soul? Don't you think the soul that God created in you would yearn for more? And that's what was happening with Nicodemus. That's why he came. Because he knew something was missing. And so what Jesus was basically saying to him is there's more to a relationship with God than what you can physically see and what you can physically touch. That was Nicodemus' message when he said, you must be born again. Salvation, being right with God, is a spiritual event. Remember, he said, flesh gives birth to flesh, 
but spirit, capital S, spirit gives birth to spirit. That's how it reads in my NIV Bible. Listen to how it reads in the New Contemporary Version Bible, which is a much more modern translation even than my New International Version Bible. In the New Contemporary Version, it reads like this. Humans give life to their children, yet only God's spirit can change you into a child of God. And so here's the message again. Salvation is first and foremost a spiritual event. It's not something that you achieve through physical acts or physical actions. It is first and foremost a spiritual event. Physical things don't lead to a deep, meaningful, and lasting peace, the kind of peace that God created all of us to crave. Doing physical things to somehow earn a right relationship with God that gives you peace will always fall short. Just like pursuing the things of the world to, to find peace will always fall short because at best all you'll get is a counterfeit peace. It won't last. The secret to finding the genuine spiritual peace that comes from a right relationship with God is a spiritual matter because life is more than just our physical existence. And if you want to find real peace, you've got to embrace spiritual life. Somebody say amen to that. Nicodemus needed to learn that. Here's the second thing Jesus told Nicodemus, and I'll capture it with one single word. Write down this second word. The second word is supernatural. First word is spiritual. The second word is supernatural. Go back to John chapter uh, 3 and verse 3, and, G and Jesus says to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth. I know we've read this several times, but it's the heart of the message. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God. And again, I, as I told you, that means no one can be right with God. No one can be saved unless he is born again. Now, those two words, born again, um, are, are difficult words for some believers for some reason. Those, 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 those words kind of have a bad rap in the church sometimes. But those words could also be translated. If it makes it a little bit easier for you, then I'll tell you that those words born again can also be translated, write this down somewhere, born from above. Born from above. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And they can also mean born from above because what Jesus is talking about is a supernatural act of regeneration where God changes your life from the inside out. That's salvation. It is a supernatural act of regeneration where God changes your life from the inside out. I'm going to hold my place in John chapter 3, and I'm going to turn to the right in my Bible until I get to the book of Ephesians. You can do that with me, or you can just stay right there because I'm going to put all these verses up on the screen. But one of my favorite chapters in all of Paul's letters is Ephesians chapter 2. And as I look at Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is writing, obviously, to the believers in the church of Ephesus, and this is what he says in verse 1. He says, as for you, okay, he's getting really personal right now. He says, this is to you. Mount Pleasant family, this is to you. Impact family, this is to you. Pay attention. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. The word transgressions is just another word in the New Testament that is translated sin. It just has a different, a little bit of a different nuance. The basic word for sin means to miss the mark. The basic word for transgression means to miss your step. A little bit of a different nuance. We don't have time to talk about the difference right now. But he says, as for you... You were dead. This is the way you were before you became a believer. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And then he went, goes on in verse 2 and says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Of course, he's talking about the devil there. He says in this really blunt and graphic description, this is the reality of life for anyone who was not a Christian, this, let me say it like this, this is the reality of life in this world for anyone who tries to make it just totally on their own based on their own merit. You're dead in your sins and your transgressions. And then after he continues to describe that death in verse 3, and really, listen, the simplest way for us to understand what he means by death, you were dead, means you're separated from God. It's talking about a spiritual death Obviously, death is being separated from God. Let that sink in for a minute. 
And after talking about that a little bit more in verse 3, then he goes on and says this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. And these are some of the most glorious words in all the Bible. He says, but, everyone say but, but. You ever notice how, ever notice how but is really a, an important word in the English language? He says, but, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. And then he says, it is by grace you have been saved. What does that mean, friends? It means in a supernatural, everyone say supernatural, supernatural way, God creates spiritual life in us when we're spiritually dead. And while Paul doesn't specifically mention it in this particular text of Scripture, the Bible makes it clear in many other places that all of this happens as the result of what Jesus did when he came into the world and he died on the cross in our place. He died a substitutionary death. He took our punishment. He paid the price for our sin and our transgression so that need of God for justice with regard to sin and, trans and transgression could ultimately be satisfied. You've heard me talk about this so many times. You've, you've, if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard me do the, the, the record book of sin illustration. My hand represents me. This is my life. Uh, this book is not a Bible. It's a record book of every sin I've ever committed from the time I was old enough to be held accountable for my actions. You put that record book of sin on top of me and you don't even see me anymore. You don't even see you anymore. All we see is the reality of sin. God in heaven looks down and he loves me with an everlasting love. He loves you with an everlasting love and created us to live in fellowship together. But we can't. Why? Because our, our sin, my sin, your sin, it separates us from God and a holy God. A holy God can't live in fellowship with sinful man. But because God didn't want it to be that way, he wanted to live in fellowship with us, this is what he did. He came down to the world in the person of Jesus because, remember, Jesus was no ordinary man. He was God in human flesh. And he went to the cross and died on the cross. And when he was on the cross, God the, when God the Son was on the cross, God the Father took our sin, mine and yours, and he placed it on Jesus from heaven. He punished him in our place for our sin so that now, because of what Jesus has done, not anything that we could ever do, but what Jesus has done, there's nothing that has to stand between us and God. And this is a supernatural act, friends, a supernatural act. There's a supernatural element to our salvation. And that's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus as he sees the need of Nicodemus' heart. God in salvation creates spiritual life from death. And it's a supernatural act. Let me give you a third word. And the third word is this. It's the word simple. Write that down somewhere. That brings us to the very heart of our story. And what I said earlier were arguably the most familiar words in all the Bible, John 3, 16. Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus ultimately led to a simple explanation of how you experience the kingdom of God, how you experience a right relationship with God, how you experience salvation, how you find the peace in your life that Nicodemus was seeking in John 3, 16, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let me ask you a question. Can it be any simpler than that? It can't be any simpler than that. The key to spiritual life is to believe in Jesus. I don't mean you simply believe in intellectually that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. I mean, you put your faith and your trust in the truth that because Jesus was no ordinary man when he came into the world and died on the cross for your sin and mine, his death was enough to satisfy God's need for justice with regard to sin. And because he rose from the dead and returned back to his heavenly position of glory by virtue of believing in him, trusting in him, putting your faith in him, you can have your sin forgiven and have the supernatural experience of being made new. Some of our, our favorite words in the Bible are these words right here from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, where Paul writes and says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And then he goes on to say, The old is gone, the new has come. 
In Christ is, 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 is what happens when we're saved. We become people who are moved from in our sin to people who are in Christ. That's a good way to describe salvation. But the word in this verse that stands out to me the most has always been the word new. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. In the original language of the New Testament, that word new is the Greek word kainos. We've talked about this before, but it's been a while. There are multiple words in the Greek language that can be translated new. But in this particular verse, as Paul wrote, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he chose the word kainos to describe this reality of salvation, making you a new creation. And here's what's significant about the word kainos. It doesn't mean new in the sense of time. It means new in the sense of quality. It means a new kind. It means new in the sense of unprecedented. And so here's what Paul is telling us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And here's what Jesus wanted Nicodemus to understand in John chapter 3. When you believe in Jesus, when you put your faith in him, you get a new kind of life that is unprecedented in that it becomes in that moment completely forgiven and completely clean. And that's that supernatural work of God that I was talking about just a moment ago. You don't, when you become a Christian, you don't get this blessing of having the, the clock rewound and you go back from the beginning so you can try to live your life and not make the same mistakes you made over again. Aren't you glad? I don't want to do that. You want to do that? We probably all have things in our lives that if we had the opportunity to do them again, we would do something different. But I don't want to go back from the beginning and go through this all again, do you? No way. It's okay. You don't have to. Because this is not being new in the sense of time. This is being new in the sense of quality. This unprecedented event happens where your life becomes forgiven. Your life moves from being one that's covered in sin to one that's covered in Christ. And that's the blessing of salvation. This is what God does. And it all starts with believing in Jesus. I like to say it like this. It all starts when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, putting your faith in who he is and what he's done for you. Now, that faith is, again, more than just an intellectual decision. You know, it's, it's heartfelt. It's, it's a surrender. It's a complete trust. It's demonstrated by repentance in our lives, which is a willingness to turn away from sin and turn to God to demonstrate that there's a difference in our life now. It's, it's spoken through confession by being willing to say out loud what you believe in your heart. That I always think about Peter's great confession in Matthew 16 when he said in answer to Jesus' question, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Paul said in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's spoken. It's a faith that's spoken. It's a faith that's expressed through baptism. Don't we love to witness baptisms on the weekends? When someone is, was, is joined together in the act of baptism with Jesus in his death and his burial and his resurrection, which is what enables us to have our sin forgiven, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and they rose from the dead. It's not just an intellectual decision. But being right with God begins and ends with believing. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was a seeker and because, he was, and because Jesus was willing to answer his questions. Ultimately, Nicodemus became a believer. We know that from John's account of what happened after Jesus died on the cross. You remember the story of when Jesus died on the cross, a man named Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate granted his request. And then afterwards, we're told in John chapter 19 and verse 39, this about Joseph of Arimathea as he got Jesus' body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. I think there are two fundamental things to take from this story, and Brian and the team can come. First, we can't be afraid of people's questions when it comes to matters of faith. Don't be afraid of questions. 
You know, I know for a fact that one of the fundamental reasons why so many Christians are never involved on any level in sharing their faith or reaching out to people is that they're afraid of what kind of questions might come. Don't be afraid. I've been a Christian for over 50 years. I've spent my entire adult life as a pastor in the local church, and I don't have any problems, not for a second, I don't have any problem saying to someone, I don't know the answer to that question. Let's try to find it together. Because I don't know all the answers. I don't even know all the questions. People ask me some pretty crazy questions sometimes. Let's try to find the answer together. We live in a day where there are going to be a lot of questions. And the Christian faith, as I said in the introduction, is strong enough to stand in the face of any question or any objection. It's okay. A man named Paul Borthwick has written a helpful book on this subject, and the book is called Stop Witnessing and Start Loving. He tells the story of a guy he got to know at a gym over a period of months, and eventually he invited the guy to have lunch with him one day for the purpose of sharing his faith with him. And after a little bit of small talk, he said, I'm just going to dive right in. I'm just going to cut right to the chase. And the man's name was Bill. He said, Bill, have you ever heard the message that God loves you and offers you the gift of eternal life? Right there over lunch. And Bill responded, yes. But then he asked this, but can I ask you a couple of questions? And Paul said, sure. And Bill went on, and these were his questions. What do you mean by God? What do you mean by he loves me? And what do you mean by eternal life? And it was that moment that Paul Borthwick had an awakening, and he realized, I need to slow down. I need to just talk to Bill for a while. I need to develop a friendship with him, a relationship with him. I need to learn about his life and where he's at spiritually speaking. I need to find out the kind of things we need to talk about. Don't be afraid of questions. Don't be afraid of questions, even if they're questions that you don't know the answer to. God is big enough to handle the questions that people bring. The second thing that really stands out to me from this message is that we can't ever for even a second forget that Jesus is the only answer for the deepest needs of the human heart. I want you to pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for our time together in the Word, and I pray that you would really uh, speak to our hearts, guide and direct our, our lives, and challenge us tonight, God. Challenge us. Uh, to follow the example of Jesus. Help us to be a church that welcomes people who have questions and people who have doubt so that we can love them, we can get to know them better, we can learn how to answer those questions, we can pray and that you can guide and direct us. Help us to be a church where people who are seeking are drawn to find the answers that their hearts long for. We love you and we thank you so much for the salvation we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing before we're dismissed.